All right, great. Hey, welcome everyone. This is uh, the next to last session of the On Violence Experimental Study Sequence uh, that is led by the students of MCS 201 here at UC Riverside, the course on racial colonial violence. Um, I'm Dylan Rodriguez. I'm the professor for the course. Uh, I teach here at UC Riverside in the Department of Black Study and the Department of Media and Cultural Studies. And uh, the students of MCS 201, you'll see them on camera in just a second. And folks will introduce themselves as we go. Um, it is absolutely a pleasure and honor, um, a joy to welcome my comrade, my friend, my collaborator, my co-conspirator, Dean Spade, into the, into the session this week. We read um, Dean's book, Mutual Aid, and we'll proceed as we have with previous um, sessions of this experimental study sequence where we will ask the, um, the students in MCS 201 to kind of instigate the, and catalyze the discussion. So we'll go for about an hour, a little over an hour, maybe hour, 10 minutes or so. Um, and I will try to do my best to leave some time near the end of the session for folks here that are in attendance. We have a good number of people in attendance. Um, so I'm gonna ask folks in attendance for your grace because I, I am positive we will get to a tiny fraction of the thoughts and questions that folks in attendance might want to share. So I ask for your patience and grace with that. Although I do want to say, um, if folks would be okay with posting their thoughts and questions in the chat, I'd be more than happy uh, to repost those once once this recording, the recording of today's study session is put online. We can put it in um, the text um, of, of, the, of, the YouTube, of the YouTube video and so forth. That's assuming you're okay with that. If you would rather your stuff in chat not go up there in terms of a thought or a question, just say so and I'll and I'll redact it. But yeah. other than that, um welcome yeah. and I want to say welcome to you and then and then um and then I'm gonna throw it right into some questions from from our from our folks here. So let me flip the camera around and then um we'll get started everybody. Thanks everybody for coming. Okay, so um I think I'm gonna ask Liza, why don't you get us started? Okay. Hi, um, I'm here in the, the the classroom with Dylan. I'm um, a PhD student in the English department and I'm taking uh, Dylan's MCS class. Um, I'm glad to, to be in conversation with you today and with um, everyone who's present at the event today. Um, so my opening question is, um, how has your, or how have your mutual aid practices, uh, Dean, been influenced by uh, by queer ways of being. Um, and I'm thinking, of course, of how um, you are participating in a, a trans lineage of activism. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you for that great question, because it is really true that I come to all my politics first through doing like feminist and queer liberation work. And then getting disillusioned in the ways that like liberal forms became really dominant um, and visible in the, you know, 90s and onward. And so we get this like, you know, um, very law reform focused agenda for queer and trans work, first queer and now trans um, or gay and lesbian and then trans, um, you know, like marriage, cops, military service, um, hate crime law stuff. So my, like a lot of my initial politicization was that like I became part of the the other track of queer and trans liberation work which is centered in like you know hating war and wanting to end racism and policing and um, immigration enforcement and whatnot and we all had this really big critique of this law and order centered um gay and lesbian rights kind of formation that became so visible and has become like you know so mainstream that most people don't even know there was ever like a different agenda that has you know been ongoing the whole time um and as part of that in that world of queer and trans organizing, what we were doing, of course, was like all the things that our more radical movements do, like, you know, trying to, um, you know, oppose the expansion of policing, trying to, um, you know, stop the expansion of immigration enforcement, trying to stop wars, and always, of course, doing mutual aid in our communities directly affected by those things. So just like supporting people, queer people in prison, supporting people in um, the immigration and enforcement processes, in psych hospitals, in shelters, um, that's that's the day to day of of those movements. Um, so um, so that was my trajectory. So a lot of the first mutual aid work I was ever involved in was just like that kind of stuff. Like something, you know, a lot of it was HIV/AIDS work in the '90s. Like we were trying to 
get the city of New York to follow its own supposed rules about how people on welfare were supposed to be treated if they had AIDS, which was like, for example, you weren't supposed to be put in a congregate shelter because your immune vulnerability, you were supposed to be allowed to have access to an SRO room, like a room in a single room occupancy hotel. Let me tell you, these are like also horrible, dangerous, terrible places. But we were like, um, you know, directly supporting people going through this process at the welfare office, none of us um, being lawyers or anything, just that we were just other people in the community who would like go and like stay with people at the office all and like not let the office close until they would give this person a room and you know like also then like locking ourselves to the doors of the human resources administration you know doing like kind of direct action piece alongside that um and working in broader coalitions around medicaid or I mean, you know various medic that's just like an example or you know similar kind of trajectories around immigration or around things with cops or um people in prisons so so yeah so mutual aid you know just it's always just part of what movements that want transformative change are doing unless they become what is unfortunately dominant in um the u.s and many places this this liberal form that's only about changing laws and policies and becomes very disconnected from like day-to-day -day people who are like kind of having the worst struggles from the system and don't really do anything that actually contacts those people and often has an, like an elite reform agenda that wouldn't actually do much for the people who are having like the roughest time in the system. And that that's kind of, you saw that in the gay and lesbian context where it's like marriage, it'll get you things if you have property, immigration status, et cetera. But if you don't have those things, it won't get them for, and then there's a person you like, it's not going to, or, you, or, or nobody wants to marry you. You know, like it's not a solution to like the deepest um, sort of life-threatening problems um, or, you know, hate crime laws, which enhance and strengthen policing and prosecution, et cetera. So that's kind of that shaping of the queer and trans liberation struggle having these very different and distinct trajectories, one being, you know, more radical or transformative and and really and really opposing racial capitalism, and one being liberal and um police loving and military loving. That's I think true of kind of all, so many movements in the US. Like those divides are visible. Um and so since I was on that other side of that, that radical side of that divide, which I got to because of my own experiences and like welfare and foster care growing up. And then like becoming queer, being like, wow, what's it mean to be queer? What's the politics of this? And then that was the exact moment of um, welfare reform, like under Bill Clinton and immigration reform and the gay and lesbian rights organizations that were emerging at the time and be doing the liberal thing, like didn't give a fuck about that. And I was like, that's not that th their politics has nothing to do with me. And then I found through my like gay retail and um and, you know, gay nightlife jobs, I found like people doing sex work activism against Mayor Giuliani, people doing activism about how immigrants were being impacted by Giuliani or how Giuliani, Giuliani was expanding um, policing criminalization of um, unhoused people and people with mental health issues. And so I found like a queer and trans politics that related to the things that I knew I cared about and had been through some of those things. And so that was like my entry point into the mutual aid work and also just learning frameworks. Of course, mutual aid work had already been going on in all the communities that I'd been part of where we were struggling, but I didn't have like a like it was these people when I met these people, they were like, yeah, let us tell you about this thing, the Black Panther Party and how they did these survival programs and why all radical work must do that. You know, that was kind of where I learned the um, the like political theory behind what I think in many ways is organic to work that is being done by people who are really um, up against the worst conditions. I think Kay has a great follow up uh, question that's that's I, th I think a joint to this point. Go ahead, Kay. Yeah, um, one of the things we were kind of talking about, um, oh, sorry, I'm Kay, uh, I'm a second year, P or a third year PhD student here uh, in English as well. Um, so one of the things we were kind of talking about is sort of like the, um, our affective responses to the way that uh, the book is written. Um, and so I was wondering if uh, you could say a little bit about um, how you kind of consider your prospective readers like effective response um, like as you're writing and also how um, kind of hearing or engaging with people's responses after they've read it uh, has has influenced you or, or um, you know, a measure of you. I mean, I really wanted this book to be very readable by a large number of people, which is, you know, is an impossible task because it's, you know, all all writing and all forms of communication are not accessible to everyone. But I was trying to make it be like, you know, stir you up and get you feel like you can do this, you know, like, I, you know, like a sense of um, generating a feeling of I can participate. Uh, I need to participate like my like 
I'm, I think one of the effects of the liberal reform agenda that's so centered on policy and law and nonprofits is that it's like some people over there are supposed to do this and they're going to take care of it. And I just like send them a donation or have their bumper sticker or their tote bag or whatever. It's like really like like there's no role for you, ordinary person who doesn't have this as a career. And so, you know, mutual aid is obviously um, the opposite of that. It's, it's lots and lots of ordinary people just taking care of each other however we can and doing what's pragmatic in the moment. So even if you have training as a lawyer, if what's needed is a diaper to change, you can change a diaper. You know what I mean? Like it's like, uh, it's it's like based in reality instead of based in like the fantasy of change coming from above. And so I wanted people to get that feeling and to have a, I had the ideas for the, in this book actually did not come from the COVID time, even though the book was published in that time. Um, I wrote these ideas down um, because when Donald Trump was elected, I was like, you know, there was all these people who were mobilizable. They were joining all these kind of like neighborhood groups. There's all these people who were like pissed and scared and like, oh my God, this person's language is so wild. A lot of people kind of waking up who were, were not already awake then also all of those of us who are already like pissed and scared, you know? And, um, and I was so frustrated. These people were being told to just like, you know, sign petitions online put up by the ACLU saying, you know, protect the constitution and like all these like nonsense, symbolic, like people are being misdirected away or just give money to Planned Parenthood, misdirected away from any actual action to defend their own communities, which of course is needed under Trump, but was of course already needed under all the prior presidents. Um, and I was like, this is the moment. And instead we were just getting like people being told, go, you know, wait for the ACLU to sue Trump and that'll fix things or something. Um, and so at that time I made this website called the Big Door Brigade and like tried to make this mutual aid toolkit. And I wrote this other article in social text about mutual aid. And I was just trying to be like, I also was pissed that in um, in college classes, when people talk about social movements, they don't include mutual aid almost ever because professors are not activists. And so they have not been part of any social movement. So they like write these things about like, what is the definition of a social movement? And it's like, they don't actually write about what people do or they miss how, what they did like it becomes all about the moment when the policy changed or when the law, you know, just it just reinforces these liberal notions. So anyway, I wrote that the social text piece, hoping to like kind of, you know, could that get into classrooms? And then um, and then I was asked to make that into a book for because like, you know, mutual aid was really popping off in the um, public sphere because of COVID. Um, but I think my, you know, my hope, I also included at the end of the book, you know, that kind of stuff that's about like problems in groups, like that's what I've spent a lot of my life doing is like supporting, like being in groups that were trying to use interesting experimental horizontal forms and then trying to support other groups to try different models and solve problems because it's just really hard to do all social justice work as I'm sure you know. And um, and so I wanted people to feel also when they read this, I wanted people to absorb some of those principles. Like let's not be assholes to each other. Let's not try to get famous doing this. Let's, you know, like just some of the basic horizontal principles of like, um, you know, care, compassion, you know, transformative justice principles about dealing with conflict, you know, so trying to make that like, you know, use it. I wanted to make the book skimmable. That's why there's like bullets and charts. Like I just wanted it to be kind of easy and I wanted people to then take it and like reproduce it as their own, you know, just like lift the content for their zines, that kind of thing, um, which I think people somewhat have, which is really cool. Excellent. Um, we, we have a, we have another, another question that I think is connected to this stuff from Stella. That's just, hi. Just let me share it. It's nice to meet you, Dean. And I'd like, please, uh, could you talk a little bit about the law related to unblack and unblack women? I share the question on the chat for help you to understand my. Oh, great. It's a little bit hard for me to hear you, Stella. Would you say it one more time? Uh, I would like to know, please, could you talk a little bit about law reform? related to unblack and unblackness. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways that I think about this a lot, you know, I teach law students um, and they come to school very clearly, the ones who wanna change the world, they come to school with a like a lot of what led them to law school is a story that's so prevalent in the United States that like the law should and does resolve the conflicts of um, oppressed people. And the main story in the U.S. about that is about anti-Blackness and that anti-Black racism was resolved by legal reforms ranging from, um, you know, the 13th Amendment to, um, you know, the end of Jim Crow and the Civil Rights Act and, and these kinds of things, Voting Rights Act. And that story that kind of like the U.S. law and U.S. Constitution is basically perfect. And you can, if you feed things into it correctly, justice will come out the other side, you know, is like, 
the the anti-black story because it says that that anti-black racism is over and it says that this fundamentally anti-black um formation the united states and its laws and its law enforcement that it's not anti-black so it's like it's so foundational and then it's used as the anti-black framing for all other resistance struggles it's like be be like black people get your freedom under the law and it and so that requires um completely er is er ex uh, erasing all current harm to black people under the law and law enforcement and like the economic conditions etc so i think it's kind of like totally foundational and then the so that's the the narrated story is the story about how anti-blackness was resolved by u.s law and that means u.s law is like perfect and kind of kind of like deified you know um the constitution's like this sparkly thing and fix anything um and then the subtext is that colonialism is, isn't even mentioned so it's like the story about anti-blackness being fixed is the is like the the headline in that story about U.S. law and the the story that doesn't even get to be talked about is um is that you know obviously colonialism not fixed <laughs> you know like here just having settler colony so um that yeah I feel like it's uh it's pretty profound and I see my students go through an actual like experience of grief and loss um students from all, all different backgrounds, you know, black students who want to come to law school and, and, and help their communities. And also like every other student who's imbibed this story about anti-blackness and the law, because they're like, oh God, th I thought this was how I could do anything about what's happening. And that's, that's the job of law is to say, hey, look over here. This was, this is where we're going to fix it. Um, and, and don't, um, you know, be lawless and disrupt this, you know, brutal system that's hurting the people you love or people you care about. Um, that's, I guess that's like one cornerstone, but I mean, obviously it's just like, the entire law is anti-black in the United States. It's like all of it. <laughs> That's a good premise to begin from, I think. Right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the liberty of asking of asking you of, of trying to think through a couple keywords. Um, and I think this is this is I think resonates with the way you wrote the book is that is that it offers some really I think um, activating definitions of things obviously especially mutual aid differentiated against philanthropy against charity against uh the savior state and so forth so i i don't want to rehash that because folks who pick up the book will see that as soon as they open the page however there are a couple key terms that i think everyone here probably folks that are in attendance would love to hear you think about um so there's two of them that that our our seminar was thinking about an hour before before you came on with us um so i'll give you both of them and maybe you can just think through them with us. One, one, one is kind of a, the, the, the related terms, liberation and liberatory, right? Um, we want to hear you think about that, right? What is liberation? What is liberatory together? And then the second one that we actually spent a lot of time talking about during the seminar is accountability, the concept of accountability. And, and, I'll, and I'll preface that by saying that part of our discussion had to do with demystifying um, the fetish, the mythologies, um, by which I really mean the liberal fetish, the liberal mythologies of accountability that impute the possibility of accountability into power relationships, systems, institutions, bureaucratic apparatuses that actually have no accountability, right? So, so the obvious reference would be police, you know, of uh, that kind of that kind of irreconcilable antagonism between movements that are desperately trying to resist and survive police violence, anti-Black police violence in particular, um, and, then, and then the subsequent demand being for police accountability, which doesn't fucking exist, right? It's like, it's not actually possible to do that. So anyway, given that, and, and we were talking about the university context too, right? how the administrative apparatus of the university so dissipates authority and decision-making that there's it's just basically structured in plausible deniability, right? So there's, so again, we're talking about um, you know, pushing back against the genocidal Israeli state's, um, you know, destruction and siege of, of Palestinian people and life and being. Um, and part of the demand is for university accountability, which does, again, it doesn't really fucking exist, right? Um, unless it decides it does. So um, with that, I, I, I think we wanted to hear you just talk about those keywords, liberation, liberatory, and then accountability. And then from there, I think I'll throw it over to Brianna after after we're done with this point, and then um, and you can just share with us what you were thinking about. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Dean. Yeah, the, I mean, I love this incredibly hard question. Um, one thing that I often, sometimes my students and I read this book called um, 
oh, I'm not, not okay, forget that. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's a book in which uh, this person is kind of giving um, like a like a breakdown of tons of different radical ideas to make it really easy for um, people who are starting out and kind of the background of them. And she has this whole section on freedom. And I think it's really related to the question about liberation and liberatory. Like freedom is a word that like, it's like your freedom to buy like name brand razors. I mean, like if freedom is just like so, and liberation are, are so broadly used that it is really important for us to talk whenever we're in a group and we think we're doing liberation work together about like what that even means for any of us, because then we could, I'll a find out if we have like important differences and and b be like what you know what, what how do we challenge each other's ideas of liberation i think for me um liberation is a like one element of liberation is about removing punishment systems that punish us for like trying to survive for being who we are you know so i spent a lot of my life trying to remove things that punish people for their gender expression like that that like make if you express your gender this way that make your life like really dangerous or kill you or like not have things you need or punish you for not organizing your family this way. Like I want to get rid of all marriage because it punishes people unless they organize their family in that way. You know, I want to get, I want to get rid of everything that's like the boot on our neck, whatever you, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and then another piece of liberation for me is like, you know, everything for everyone, like I, everyone on earth could have all the water, food, shelter, clothing, um, you know, delightful connection that they need and there are like a very small number of people running a very intense set of systems that make that happen so liberate like liberation requires um and so a lot of liberation is about just like taking that stuff back like oh wow it's a fiction like the idea of the united states is a fiction the idea of law is a fiction like we are like you know money is a fiction like we are held under these very intense systems of control that are very material but they're also like bad spells that have been cast on us. So part of liberation is like, for me, like what are the moments where you noticed you were under a spell? What are the moments where you were like, oh my God, there's a like a lie that like um, skinny is good and fat's bad. Fuck, like it's in my head, it's in my heart. What do, how do I clear it? You know what I mean? Oh, the world looks different when I clear it or when I even get a crack, you know, or I've been told this or that about myself or others or about sexuality or about, um, race or you know what I mean like those moments so like kind of looking for the liberation vibe because of course total liberation is not um it's like revolution it's like total freedom like we have no idea what we are under so much control that like we're like trying to like just find the edges and like can we together like grab hold of the guardrail and pull it back a little bit you know like it's 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 like that because it's really bad in here so I think liberation you know is collective like I don't even know what I'm missing until I do collective work with you all and you're like Dean you're not seeing this this is living in you too this is living in the way we're talking about this we just did this in a way that actually reinforced something we we're trying to get rid of oops you know like that liberation is um a horizon that we don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about it but we're like oh that felt good that felt, we moved towards that that oh I just noticed a crack oh we just felt like we could do something we didn't think we could do before so we're like fighting these battles against these material conditions and also against like the spells that like we are deeply under accountability i mean i love what you said dylan i agree accountability is really hard because like a lot of times in our communities we like that word we want um we want to we want accountability one part of it is releasing liberal fantasies like you're saying releasing the idea that like the university is going to become something that's like for students never has been never will be it's first it's like first settler colonial capitals project right um or releasing the idea that the police could become useful. No, they are a violent force. So like a lot of our movements help us get like, you know, that kind of clarity around what can't be accountable. But there's also a huge accountability narrative inside our own abolitionist circles about how we become accountable. And that is a very different definition of accountability. The, the one I've heard Shannon Perez Darby use that I like is something along the lines of like, accountability is a process in which I check to see whether my actions align with my values. And, you know, they don't like most of, you know what I mean? Like we all need a lot of work on that. And I, sometimes I don't know that unless I get feedback from others. That's the main way we find out that we are not in alignment with our values. Oh, I didn't know I was impacting you the way that I acted in this meeting, the way that I spoke to you, the way that I didn't show up, whatever. Um, and that, you know, is like, I wish we had a different word than accountability, right? This is, I also really wish we had a different word than work for the stuff we do inside social movements when we change that type or when we like accompany someone to that hearing because the word work is caught up in the wage system. So we're really, we're really, it's hard. A lot of these words, we're trying to use them for to say things that are beautiful and important. And then they also are heavily weighted with how institutions use them to perpetuate themselves. 
Um, and we have to like, that means when we use it, like I, if I say, let's, you know, Hey, let's meet up and go work on the spreadsheet for where we're going to house people who are coming out of foster care. And we both feel the word work in us. And we start to feel inside an avoidance of working on the spreadsheet because we spent our lives feeling an avoidance of our homework and of our wage work. That makes sense. Like that's like emotionally like plugged in for good reasons, because we should be like feeling avoidant of those horrible coercive systems. And so, you know, there's a lot of problems with this. Are you, the word accountability is being used in some city council meeting and it's also being used in our group. And we get tricked into thinking that they're talking about the same thing as us, or they get to just be like, we, they adopt all of our language and then repurpose, rebrand their exact same murderous thing. So I don't know what to do with that because I also don't think the answer is coming up with a bunch of jargon and then like a lot of people don't understand each other. And I think we have to more as often as possible say what we mean right under it. You know what I mean? Like when we say freedom, we mean, you know, end the war in Gaza. When we say freedom, we mean everybody has housing. You know what I mean? We need to like, like still to keep it short, but like um, have that conversation more and more and more frequently or else it's like, oh, we, everyone here believes in freedom. That's like a, a liberal move is to pretend there's no controversy. This is what Zionists love to do. They love to be like, um, no, no, we're, 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 we want the same thing. You know, I'm like, no, we, there are like a lot, I'm having a lot of conversations with Zionists who are like, why are you using this label, Zionist, anti-Zionist, stop using these labels. You know, like they want it to be like, like if you, and that's why people want there to be no controversy between policed people and the police they're all just people. Let's just have a training about how we're all, you know what I mean? Like, so we want to say, no, there is a, there is actually a controversy here. There is a war. I mean, Dylan's work has really helped some people use that word more. There is a war and many other people's work for many generations back between black people and the United States, between indigenous people in the United States, between, you know, poor people and the elite, between every, the, the earth and all of its inhabitants and these, you know, ecocidal projects. So that kind of sharpening that, um, I think helps us with some of the mess of these words. Can I ask you a follow-up, Dean? Because in, 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 I'm going back to the liberation liberatory piece because you know we're talking we're talking in the lead up to the conversation with you also about about how um, and we're going to get to this as well about about, about how um, we feel things as we do various forms of political work and study and thought um, and and so as we were talking as we raised the question. And as we as you started talking about liberation, the notions of liberation and that which is liberatory, um, you know, I felt a certain kind of joy, a certain kind of incitement that was good. It was like affirming. And then and then I had to take a step back as I was listening to you and think about how the work of liberation is often quite ugly. Um, it's it's necessarily violent work um, that it requires. Uh, if, if we're going to take what you said as deeply seriously as we must. That it require that that liberation within that which is liberatory requires destruction. It requires it requires the elimination of certain things, certain systems, certain relations, for that matter, maybe certain people. Um, how do we think about that? Right, the 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 um, the difficulties, the the um, the messiness the violence of liberatory and liberation work alongside the stuff that makes us feel joyful as we think about freedom and, and the possibilities, you know, of, of um, coming to some kind of affinity with liberation. I mean, how do we do that? Or, or how do you, how do you try to do that? Like, cause I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. So I end up getting wrapped up in one, one thing or the other. I vacillate between those things, but I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you have a way of thinking about it. I think one thing is that lib uh, liberalism wants us to feel really um, like progress is happening and hopeful, like a really empty hope and skip grief. So like, like, like grief is like the most radical feeling in, uh, in capitalism and liberalism, I think, because we're just supposed to skip it. We're, you're, you know, people in your family die, you get three days off work. Like, you know, your whole community is under attack for centuries. You better, you know, like do a good job on this college thing and fix it all. You know what I mean? Like, it's very like, do not grieve, do not feel how painful what's happening is. Because if you felt it, you might be like enraged and be disorderly and, you know, whatever. So I, I think that's part of this is like, there's a, there's much more time spent. And also, I think that when we turn off grief, we turn off joy. So then we don't, because they're on the same, you know, they're, they're like real emotions. And so then we don't ever also have real joy because we're kind of numbed out. And so like, in order to like have liberatory emotional um, range that could prompt us to take proper action 
instead of like I join the group and I just want to dominate others or I just want to see my way that's when that's when we use escalated tactics get dangerous between us even is when we're numbed out and hierarchical and you know people do you know racist or masculine and stuff whatever so I think that's one piece of it is like a bigger role of grief also I love that you said that things need to be destroyed I just had this conversation with Kelly Hayes we're talking about sci-fi and like speculative fiction and how I hate I personally hate what I really care about speculative fiction I find it really useful I'm trying to think about what's going to happen I think authors are sometimes smart they've researched a lot it's really useful but they all add in all this technology to deal with the problems and this technology is either not coming or it's not coming before societal collapse or if it comes it'll just be designed for military and police purposes like every technology we use now so it's just really annoying when they like and Kelly said that she's writing some kind of sci-fi speculative fiction book and it's focused on destroying technology. Like actually what we need to do probably in our revolutionary movements is not about like <laughs> building more because most of the technology that's out there, it's all used for like these warfare and surveillance purposes. I thought that was just like, it's like so much destruction has to happen for this kind of liberation. There's just, we like live on an apparatus of like, you know, military extractive, exploitive systems. And it's really terrifying. I think one thing that's useful to remember is that like, we didn't set it up this way. Humans have resisted the state form warfare, um, you know, uh, inequality of all kinds for all time. And small elites have made them happen. And they've done that through extreme violence. So it's not surprising that violence is necessary to undo it. Like they're not going to put their weapons down because we make a good argument at city hall. Right. And so it's going to be an actual, it's going to be and is and has already been till forever it's actual brutal um, confrontations. And a lot of that is hidden from certain people or it's made into like, it's not narrated as violence. It's like, it's okay for the police to like pick people up and kidnap them and put them in cages. And we are like, that's not violent. You know, so that it, it's like all these narratives hide what's actually happening. And yeah, we have to actually fight back. And when people do, they also get made an example of, and there's extreme repression and we see that. And so it makes sense that we're scared of it. And also because we're scared of it, we maybe don't study closely enough. Like what, what are better ways to do it? What are the worst ways that it would have been the, the pitfalls when people have taken up bolder tactics that are absolutely necessary. And I think people are all turned away from that. And I, one place that I see this, you know, I'm, um, I'm sure many of you know that in um, August, 61 activists were, um, uh, who are part of the Defend the Atlanta Forest uh, Stop Cop City movement. They're trying to stop a police training facility from being put on top of this forest in Atlanta. Um, they were um, they were indicted on these like domestic terrorism charges and these like um, racketeering and conspiracy charges. And they're framed and you know as like these people who have this horrible, you know, anarchist conspiracy, et cetera. And um one of the responses that a lot of people had was, oh no, a lot of these people are just handing out flyers. They're just trying to stop, you know? And it, there's a kind of distancing from mm -hmm. the fact that's because some of them are using tactics like occupying the trees in the forest, destroying this, the equipment that's being used to make, to tear the forest down. Of course, that's a great idea to sabotage the projects of our opponents. They're not just begging the, you know, the city to stop. They're not going to by begging. We've tried that in many situations. They're also taking direct action. And that it also includes a huge public information campaign that includes flyers, flyers and Molotov cocktails and fires and living in a tree, you know, and watching people try to distance themselves. To me, that's like the legacy of this, um, this fear of, um, of, of bold tactics and of armed resistance, which has always been part of resistance, um, you know, here by indigenous people, by black people, by, you know, by Puerto Ricans, by so many different people who've been who, who've been fighting um, violence and injustice here and all over the world, um, colonized people. So yeah, so I think it's we've got a it's it's really hard. There's a really big um, narrative about pacifism and that is goes hand in hand with liberalism and it's supposed to keep us all in our places, doing some ineffective marches once in a while and writing things on Instagram and um, and you know things stay the same. And 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 then when people try to do something more bold, a lot of times we just throw them under the bus. So there's a lot of um, yeah pain there yeah just two shout outs one to robert and mabel williams who taught me that pacifism taught many of us that that pacifism shit will get you killed um so just shout out to that lesson from robert and mabel williams and then secondly as you were talking about to, to to bounce back to your reflections on accountability and the difficulties around that term um one of the one of the organizations and um um and a couple of people you you introduced me to Martin Martin Cabral and Amika Tendahi who created Ujima Medics in um, South Side Chicago. Uh, in conversation with them, I brought that question to them about accountability. And 
And I think it was Amika who, who um, really taught me a lesson about shifting the terms potentially to the, to the terms of shared or deep responsibility. So the notion of shared or deep responsibility, I think provides at least momentarily an alternative um, a meaningful alternative, not just not just a kind of superficial wordplay alternative, but a meaningful alternative to um, the notions of accountability that you would get wrapped up in liberal magical thinking or um, the toxicity of you know corporate notions of accountability. Um, so shout out to Ujima Medics. I'll put a link to their organization in the chat in just a second. Sometimes um, I use collective stewardship. Yes. Because also responsibility, people sometimes, you know, like Obama right. loved to say personal responsibility, yes, yes, which is yes. basically like, it's your fault if you're poor. Yes. Um, and so trying to, but a responsibility, like there's there's a really cool book called, um, oh God, am I all, everything is escaping me today. A wonderful book by these, by Carla Bergman and Nick um, Montgomery, Joyful Militancy. And okay. they talk about response responsibility as are you able to respond are you able to respond to the current conditions are you actually responding to what's happening are you responding to a fantasy about change or you're are you like projecting on your your comrades when you you know what i mean i love their if, if i recommend people uh, joyful militancy is a pretty fun book and their thing about responsibility made me feel like i maybe could find really good ways to use that word even though it's got these scary like anti-welfare um uses by obama and clinton and others but yeah i, I think i sometimes use co-stewardship to talk about people sh sharing the bag in a group, not having just one person hold the bag, not having one, you know, like actually being like, I'm going to step up and like kind of try to also know what's going on in the whole group. And we're going to all try to know and be transparent with each other. Like trying to come up with words that are not words no one's ever heard, but that also like give you a new feeling that doesn't feel like old baggage about how you need to work harder at a job or something that I feel like is in some of these words. But I like, I think adding deep really does help with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it over to uh, another another one of our graduate students here, uh, Brianna, who's gonna ask a great question, um, share some thoughts with us, and then I want to invite folks, the 80 or so people who are in attendance, um, folks, folks, I think in a maybe in a few minutes I'd like to open it up for any additional thoughts or discussion from folks who are here in attendance. So feel free to use the group chat. Um, um, otherwise, you can feel free to use the group chat if you just would like to come on live um, to share some thoughts and ask a question, that kind of thing. Okay, um, I'm gonna throw it over to Brianna. Hi, Dean. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm an anthropology. My work focuses on anti blackness and uh, so I have some questions that I feel like you have answered, particularly around like the need for shared definitions or something that's more specific so we can understand and have a language. Um, so I have a question around imagination, and I was reading what you were saying as imagination being deeply tied to belief and like what we are externalizing in our relationships is, a, is an extension of what we actually believe. And so I feel like in the work, what was coming up for me is that there's like an outdated belief that you can't leave anyone behind. We all have to think the same way to do this work or that, um, oh, I forgot my third point. But those those are some of the notions. And so I'm wondering, like, in saying, like, how do we do this hard work? There seems to be a call to marry the thinking knowing with the feeling knowing. And I'm wondering, like, what is it that mutual aid is supposed to be rehearsing that in your wildest imagination it allows? I missed one word you said, which is that you study anti-Blackness and, and then I missed the next noun. What was that? Oh, I study anti-blackness in Kenya. Kenya, cool. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to know that about you. Um, that's such a juicy, amazing question. I think that, um, because, well, one part of this is that because we live in a society that is so atomizing and we're treated as individuals and we're also t disempowered, like we always are in a hierarchy, like at work and at school and in church and your family, like there's always a boss and, and, and someone else gets to make decisions and they get to give you feedback, but you don't really get to give them feedback. And we're all kind of scared of getting in trouble, like all of that stuff. And we're also kind of passive, like, oh, someone else should take care of our needs. And I don't really need to know how the electric grid that I live in works. In. And I don't really need to know how my computer works. I don't, it's like, I don't know most of how my life works. It just kind of comes to me if I do the things I'm supposed to do and be obedient. You know, like all of that is our context. To me, mutual aid is a potential space to have a different experience. I collaborated with people I knew, not because we were being paid or anyone made us, 
already already just doing things voluntarily instead of being coerced is not something most of us are used to um i did this because i wanted to and i felt strongly about something and actually got to do something about it instead of just observe it on tv being like oh i'm gonna watch what what are the people gonna say in dc like i got to be an active participant about something i cared about with others that is like what life actually is that is mostly being taken away from us. And that's actually what's happening in our jobs. Like if we're at our jobs, you know, making food for a bunch of people who come to this restaurant or whatever, or making this, you know, um, whatever, making spreadsheets or whatever we do, we actually are collectively making things with people, but we can't see that because we just are like, oh, we're being made to do it. And we have to do it through the wage and the boss is in charge and we have to do it the way they say, you know, we're missing that we actually made the food, you know? Um, and and that's because of the f fiction of money and the fiction of the hierarchy and everything. So mutually is a chance to be like, oh, I felt like doing something. I did something with others. We got to evaluate it together. We didn't lie and say it was perfect because we weren't being paid or like getting, we weren't doing it for media attention or to become famous. So we were just like, oh, fuck. Like we did that in a way that accidentally excluded Spanish speakers. We need to fix that. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, we did that on a Thursday and that's the same day the church does their thing. Let's move it to Wednesday. Like it's, it's people get the experience of like, getting out of our nonsense world and what you just have to do it however the boss or the teacher said or, or the parent or your mean husband or whatever the deal is whoever the hierarchy is or or you have to try to boss to be other people around to get your way and not listen to others to a like hmm if we listen to everybody here we'll probably come up with a better plan none of us are getting paid for this we'd like to do the best possible plan and we're all feeling urgent about you know what's happening for unhoused people when it's about to rain or whatever so we actually want to do something that works so all of that to me feels like it's um, a pedagogical experience that is transformative for us about who we are and then it's even more so if we break the law while we do it so like i love these stories like um people stealing supplies to um you know I like uh there's all these beautiful stories um people in the 70s doing a lot of different free clinics black panthers had free clinics there were gay free clinics there were women's free clinics there was you know lots of stuff addressing like the fact that medicine was you know racist and sexist and homophobic and not available to lots of people and whatever so people are doing like free clinics like out of a trailer out of a you know basement whatever squatting the space or stealing the supplies like two people are nurses and they steal the supplies at the hospital people you know doing stuff they're not licensed to do but doing it you know in a way that's caring and safe you know like when we break the rules it's even more like the word empowering that's one of those words that's like so <laughs> taken by the nonprofit industrial complex but i think it actually is empowering like it's like it is it's mobilizing it's like we can do it where if i want it to have happen i want it to happen i'm gonna do it with other people and and that process and then other things like getting into conflict with each other and being like, it's worth it to try to work it out because I care about what we're doing. It's more important to me to work this out with you than to make everybody else hate you. You know, like learning those kinds of skills, which are very lost in a society that's based in like punishment and individuality and like vengeance and perfectionism. So to me, like mutual aid is like, it's, I feel like it's like what has like grown me up you know, it's like what's given mm -hmm. me like the deepest friendships, like the um, experiences of humility, the chances to like uh, mess up individually or as a group and then like figure out what repair is or uh, the chances to realize that I'm not, I don't know more than other people in this group. And also when I do know something, I should say it. I shouldn't hold back if I've got a piece of information that could help people because some people do that or just like always wanting to be passive and quiet because that gets them through at a job or at school where they get punished for speaking. So I think all of that is, um kind of what you're thinking what you're asking about like the thinking and the change in beliefs but also the change in like embodied skill set and I also just love what you said the thing about like maybe we don't need unity or we don't need everyone to come along that is such a juicy question for social movements because it's like um the the appeal the idea that we need to appeal to everyone aka the lowest common denominator and that when I speak about things I care about I should be speaking to like Fox News watchers who are never going to fucking listen to me like no like speak to whoever I'm closest to who I could bring directly into this work now right like um and everybody in the whole society doesn't have to do it right now we're like society is determined by a very small group we're trying to make it be determined by like lots more different kinds of formations but we could um take up a project of trying to uh you know stop a, a police you know station building project or stop a pipeline or whatever and we don't need everybody in the whole world to agree with us we just need to be like we are called to do this this is not okay you know and that um that shift for you know we want we might want to build a certain level of unity in our group or a certain kind of coalition to try to stop something so we have more people or so that we get certain people into the conversation who we think have a lot of wisdom or skills or resources but we're not like um 
gonna just like bring it so far down and 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 rid it of all of its principles in order to bring everybody along and that's like the what kind of democratic party vibe is like water everything down so hardcore that it's meaningless and then tell everybody it has to be that way when actually of course everybody in the democratic party wants it to be that way because they're just elites who want to continue the war and continue the um exploitation and extraction so but it's like as if that's strategic and like pragmatic like we're always told like it's pragmatic to be um more conservative and we know that actually the most pragmatic thing is to support the survival of the people in the most trouble right now and that means always being the most radical you know that means being like oh yeah and we mean every undocumented person and we mean everybody in that prison and you know that's that's the way to get the greatest level of relief from the worst suffering and we're told no no leave out the people of felonies leave out people who are undocumented leave out people who don't pass you know whatever um so i appreciate that that framing yeah, I wanted to share something that just came up in the chat, which I think is beautiful um, from Rola Yasmin. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, breaking the rules is liberating for sure. I just love that <laughs> as, as a starting point, um, especially thinking of abortion meds, gender affirming meds and restricted and criminalized places. Um, they said, I know it was said earlier that liberation has violent or bloody processes, but that depends on who's looking at it and from what angle, to me at least. I, I think that's that's really well put. I appreciate that reflection a lot. Um, Liza had a really great question that came up in our in our prior discussion. And again, I want to invite attendees um, who are not the graduate students in this class. Um, feel free to keep posting thoughts and questions, anything like that. And um, and I think we can start to open it up for our last twenty five minutes or so. But um, but Liza had this 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 wonderful question that I wanted to um, to introduce to to you. Dean. So um, I guess this touches a bit on um, ideas of mindfulness and also embodiment, which came up in our discussion today in class. Um, so while reading your book, Mutual Aid, I noticed that mindfulness practices seem to be woven throughout it. Um, and I was curious, um, Dean, about when meditative and sort of metacognitive or self-reflective practices became an integral part of your activism. And also, um, as a side note, if you are influenced by Adrian Marie Brown's work, because I know she does a, a lot of work with um, somatics and, and um, mindfulness and self reflection and so on. And I'll post uh, it. What was the last thing? Oh, um, uh, oh, uh, I said I was posting the question in the chat also, I think. Cool. That might have been what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I love that you picked up on that theme in the book. I'm writing something now that's a lot more about the need for self self-awareness, emotional self-awareness practices as like essential to um, you know, being able to relate with one another. I really believe that like movements are just made of relationships. Like the world is just made of relationships. And so um mm -hmm. our like difficulties relating with others and, and also being set up to be de-skilled about relating with others and to be de-skilled to even know what we're feeling and how we're impacting others and how others are impacting us, like being numbed out and, and then also like chasing consumer highs. All of that is like a wonderful way to keep us obedient and in conflict with each other in ways that um, prevent um, collective action for resistance. And so um, I think, you know, just spending whatever, 25 years in movements, I'm just like, oh my God, we all need so much more emotional um, awareness and relational skills like that's kind of a lot of what um in addition to having like horrible opponents who have all the money and the guns we also have like we really wreck ourselves with the ways that we relate to one another that are kind of stuck in their scripts um so i really appreciate you bringing that up and yeah my, my mindfulness practice you know I, I for me it's been like really vital to go to silent meditation retreats for like you know i don't know over a decade or 15 years or something in addition to lots of other self-reflective practices because i want to I want liberation. I want to be free of I, all their scripts are in my head and they are in how I act and I see it. And I want to not act like that to people <laughs> and to myself. Um, and, and so those tools are really useful and there's lots of different versions of that for depending on what people want and need. And, you know, there's that exists in almost every tradition, some kind of contemplative reflective practice that could be spiritual and religious or not. It could be, you know, in particular, um, communities or, or histories or lineages, but I, I do find that stuff to be kind of like essential. Um, and yeah, Adrienne Marie Brown's work has influenced me um, in part, both of us are students of the same um, thing called generative somatics, which is something I, you know, studied in as a student for, you know, maybe a decade or more. Um, and we were often in classes together. Um, and a lot of those ideas are visible in her writing um, about these very questions about how we take 
how we have our lives be more like what we believe in and how we like learn how their systems have gotten set up in us, both through like trauma we've experienced and through just like norms that set us up to be um, less permeable to each other, bad at giving and receiving feedback, um, you know, scared of conflict and, and just like, what does it take to like shake those things loose and have new ways to actually be together and be with ourselves that are more likely to guess where we're trying to go or like get more of what you want. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is a big overlap in our, both of our inquiries. because we both use that tool, um, a lot. And I really appreciate also that Adrian is interested in speculative fiction. I'm interested in these people who are, you know, Margaret Killjoy, um, so many people who are, uh, like both thinking radically about our movements and then also writing interesting speculative fiction to help us try to like, I just think it's a very useful tool. I don't write fiction, but I read a lot of that stuff um, for that reason. I feel like it's important to say that even though, even though, you know, some of us don't write fiction, we might also identify as being creative writers at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that there's sometimes a conflation that a, that a creative writer necessarily has to write fiction or poetry, but that's not the case. I think that this book um, is an, an, an exemplar of, of how creative creative writing, creative, um, an artistic form of, of, of writing, of narrative comes into play. Um, so, so I want to throw it over to, um, to uh, Amanda, who you've met before, but before Amanda talks, we were all trying to figure out how you knew Amanda was a UC Riverside student <laughs> when you first met, I think at Cal State LA, right, Amanda? Yeah, yeah. So you met each other at Cal State LA, and then Amanda shared that you right away asked her, are you a student from UC Riverside? So I'm just curious how that happened. Because she asked a question about a dilemma that was like the day before I had talked to you on the phone about the same okay. dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, there was, okay, so we, so Dean cheated. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> well, kind of, because I had it, I didn't know that. Um, hi, Dean. Um, so I guess that was what, like a year ago? I don't even rem remember, but kind of just thinking about those conversations and just like even I guess more details in it. Um, the thing of just like group conflict and like solidarity and just like collective thinking, like a lot of times when we see that organizations have been um, co-opted and there's, you know, um, hierarchical, you know, issues and everything. Um, how do we, I guess, how do we work through conflict as a group when one, we know, we kind of just accept that there's money here and we just, there's some good work that's being done, even though there's harm being inflicted, um, even though it could be singling out like one or two people who might be a little more radical. Um, and even though the, 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 the group collectively understands this, they agree with it, a lot of times they can just be more passive about it because there's still good work being done, even if it reaches one or two people. Um, so I guess my question is like, how do, what do you do at that point? You know, because it's not like the money will stop coming in. Um, there's still agendas being pushed and all of that. Um, but in, in, in ways as well, it's like the harm that's being created to like say those individuals that are singled out then becomes like they're the issue um and it's not one like holding any kind of accountability or really just like pushing pushing them out um if that makes sense so i'm just kind of trying to think because you know it does kind of put people in a spot where it's like uh do i want to be like you know have solidarity with the person that I know is being harmed? Um, or do I have to just kind of show solidarity to this movement because there's still some good intentions, some good stuff going on? And because there's money there, you know? So it kind of goes back to that, like, do we just say no to the money? Um, you know, at, at what point do we step away? Or what do you do? Because it's, it's, I don't know, you know <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. I mean, the longer I'm in our movements, the more I see that funding really, really co-ops, even the best work makes it reach less people and makes the work less mobilizing and more like services for a few people, essentially, even if it's named as something else. Like it always, like what nonprofits do tends to just actually be very small. 
Like, it's like we reached 20 people this, you know, really, they might say, you know what I mean? Or the first year that's, I don't know, there's some, something very tricky about it. One of the things I think, and also what happens is they take the oxygen out of them. It's like, oh, well, now there's a group doing it. So everyone else doesn't make another group. So I think a lot of times what we just need to do is make more groups. Like I'm like splinter <laughs> and people can be in both, you know, but there needs to be a group that's more autonomous, always doing whatever it is we're talking about. And that can say whatever it wants and not be afraid of the funding. And also as soon as you have funding and people are living off of the group, the group has to be concerned about losing the funding because what people are relying on it. So it just gets bogged down. It gets bogged down with both the administrative stuff of keeping the funding going and you know doing the payroll and all of that stuff. It also gets bogged down with um, like sustaining that form because somebody's relying on it and they really are, you know? And it'd be really cool if we could just like take the money and run, but I just like don't ever see that happening. I see it really change what we're doing and change how we're doing it. So I think, yes, always solidarity with whoever's being pushed out or you know, treated badly. That solidarity can be like helping people leave and be like, yeah, let's go do something else. You know, it can also be, or let's let's have let's have a splinter group that does this and, and doesn't take the money and can do the parts of this. And that'll often push the the group that's getting more conservative because of money. If, if there's a, if there's somebody else in the in the same field, that often pushes them. To, to be more um, aligned instead of getting sucked further and further into that pattern. Sometimes the group that's got the money and is going to get a few things done that are easily more easily done with money, like they're going to do advocacy for people in courtrooms during the day or something that's like kind of professionalized, like, hey, they can go for it, but they're not going to solve the fundamental problems. They're, you know, it's going to be that narrow um, service or reform work that we know is limited. So, okay, let that happen. But do we want to try to get more community energy, more like um uh like mutual aid vibes more disruptive vibes around some other formations right instead of trying to make that all happen where the money is bogging it down you know that's that's all i've got i mean i think this is just a dilemma like this is just like an, this is this is our times is that um and especially now in the wake of 2020 when there's more money for anything related to criminal justice reform because they're trying to control our resistance work and make it professionalized it is so bad it's like it's like um, suddenly people can get paid for this stuff. And of course, everybody in our communities is broke and food is really expensive and rent's really expensive. And so then people get, they shape their project into that. And then it's stuck in exact ways that all the prior nonprofits are stuck, even though we all say, I mean, so many people reach out to me like, we're starting a nonprofit and we want to make it more like the stuff in the mutual aid book. And I'm like, as soon as you guys take the money, you've set up a bunch of problems, you know, around staffing and who are you hiring and who are you not hiring and how are you compensating them? And, you know, are the, is this a good place to work? And people become obsessed with being like good bosses and good workers. And so then already we're not spontaneous anymore. And we're like, oh, we can't do anything at night or we can't do anything, you know, like it just becomes like, um, just a, it becomes the wage labor form, you know? So, but uh, I understand what people are doing. It's not a form of judgment. And I've worked in nonprofits plenty myself, but like, um, it's a real contradiction. There are two questions in the chat. Maybe there you are. Them. There are, and I'm going to, but I want to indulge, I want to indulge myself real quick before I go to Kay's questions. Kay's got a brilliant question here. Um, well, one is just an additional point to the one you just made um, in response to Amanda, which is the thing that goes unstated way too often um, when we're talking about the funding apparatus, or sorry, the, fun, the, the kind of the funding as a center, as a terrible center of gravity that then shapes and deforms um, intent and work. It, it, it's also often accompanied by this, um, a, like, an undeniable megalomania. Right, it becomes it becomes like a me so megalomania then begins it, it sometimes will permeate and constitute those who are actually running the operation that has attracted the funding um and you know to pick on an obvious example the shit that's just gone down with even x kendy's organization at vu is wild it is absolutely wild and i also know it's the tip of the iceberg right but like there's an obvious kind of and i don't know him right but i'm saying like structurally systemically it's not an ad hominem thing. I'm saying there's a systemic kind of megalomania that is, um, I think, I think infused into these funding. It's like the more money, the more megalomaniacal systemic logic is infused into the work, and that that can only fuck things up um, for 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 the, for the rest of the people, right? Mm -hmm. That can only do that. Um, the thing I wanted to ask you, Dean, um, before I kick it over to Kay. In response to what you just said about proliferation, about creating splinter groups, about about you know trying to generate more and more autonomy, whatever scale, whatever forms that takes. Um, what would you, how would you think or talk with folks here um, and that watch this video about 
um, the, the kind of the long historical practice of various anti-colonial abolitionist, liberationist, revolutionary movements in which there, there was a militant wing to a movement. I'm talking about even a strike, right? Like what, not even a strike, including a strike, especially a strike, right? In various kinds of strikes, right? Prison strikes, labor strikes, et cetera. But, but what do you say about the idea of, of various movements for you know, transformation change, up, up, upheaval, whatever, being accompanied by an, a militant wing, an underground wing, an illicit wing, a wing that is willing to engage in forms of struggle that maybe the rest of the movement is either not capable of engaging or is not willing to, to engage. Um, how, how would you talk to us or think, think with us about that alongside, alongside, alongside mutual aid capacities and projects? Yeah, I mean, especially because I think the intensity of the liberal pacifism story in our society has made less people think that's what they need to do. They've never even heard of the militant wings of even the things that they love. You know, they don't know about the deacons of defense, even though they've studied the civil rights movement or that, you know, like that's the vibe is like we've missed, like we've been denied the story about how that is part of all social movements, just like we've also been denied that mutual aid is part of all social movements. So that you're like the Montgomery bus boycott. It was some speeches, a march done instead of like oh no that was like a giant mutual aid project about transportation and food and like people had defending each other from the cops and the kkk you know like all of this stuff i mean i think it's interesting where is it now like i was thinking about um you know there was that um police free zone in seattle during 2020 where the cops left that precinct and we had that area in seattle that was people called chop or chaz it was on the news a lot and you know ways to trying to terrify people and there were people who were armed at the um edges of that and that was self-organized. It wasn't like everybody who went to that knew those people. Nobody elected them. They were people who are already in organizations focused, like kind of gun club type organizations focused on community self-defense. So I think that's interesting. That's autonomy. Like right. that's different than something as, um, you know, well-organized as like the troops in Rojava or something, you know, but like it is interesting where in our communities and there already are people doing underground things all the time, whether that's like vandalism or sabotage Absolutely. or whether that's, um, you know, people don't, nobody reports like prison breaks, bank robberies, all that stuff is like not right. on the news because they don't want right. us to know it's possible. And they said so they make all these movies that make it seem really high tech inside those places, more than it really is maybe. Um, but anyway, I'm curious about that. I do think we need more people to gravitate towards the more risky kinds of direct action. I am curious how that stuff can be coordinated in the right ways, but not become an authoritarian military okay. style. Because okay. some movements that had have ha have run into that problem. Yeah. Um, and then I think sometimes the fact that people are armed, like I actually, <laughs> one thing I read recently, it might have been or Margaret Killjoy, somebody was talking like, if you're really drawn to being the person who's holding the gun and de-escalating people in that way, you maybe shouldn't do it. <laughs> like we also all need to self-assess, why am I the person who wants to do the different tactics? I, obviously we need more people to take on those bold tactics. We also need to do the, in the inner work about whether I'm about to become an authoritarian or whether I've got like, you know, I've seen a lot of people who are drawn to some of that stuff who came from a very violent family and had a really horrible dad. And then they start acting like that dad when mm. they, you know, so how do we um, cultivate a very, and, and I think places like Rojava and Chiapas, where you see a very feminist, very militant approach and which women become, um, women's statuses increase as the, as the movement becomes armed and, and more militant. That's, really yeah. juicy for us, given some of the downsides of some of these strategies historically. Yeah, shout out in this moment to Palestinian uh, Youth Movement and Palestinian Feminist Collective on that point. Um, um, I want to read a comment that I'm going to kick over to you, Kay. Um, I'm going to call him Tony, my friend, my comrade Tony. I'm not going to say his full name because of the content of the comment, but I did want to read the comment out loud because it's beautiful. Um, my, my comrade Tony says, when it comes to cop city, well, stop cop city specifically, they mean by any means necessary. Um, and Tony uh, is a firefighter, right? So this is, I know that he's, he's writing from this position. The fire department is being brought in as justification to build Cop City and get people that have not thought of firefighters as caseworkers to the policing system. The fire department is very violent and oppressive. It is not mutual aid. We stand back for police when someone is shot. Don't wait for us, please don't. Ujima Medics, um, that was mentioned earlier, makes this very clear. We reinforce, we reinforce this problem with kids, call 911, et cetera. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. I want to re refer you all to, for people who are interested, Margaret Kiljoy has some interesting stuff on her podcast about how anybody can form 
a firefighting unit and like how we should have mutual aid firefighting units that are not part of the policing system, just like Tony's saying, you know, that do that do are an extension of policing work, but instead that because fire is a huge issue, especially for people in California, like what would it look like for all of us who are able to and interested to do community defense through firefighting training? And she has some really interesting stuff about that. So just Margaret Kiljoy in general, her podcast, um, something about the end of it. We live like the world is dying. Like it's just dying. Yep. juicy. Yep. I'm, gonna, I'm putting the link up right now in, in the chat. And then let me kick it over to you, Kay. Um, yeah, my question is just like, um, how do we learn to recognize and differentiate between the kinds of negative emotions that come from things like burnout and perfectionism and like being in a reactive state, like that's rooted in our personal history um, and these kinds of things from like the kinds of negative emotions that come from like being a person and doing legal aid in late stage capitalism. Um, like how do we recognize the signs of burnout and find like those real kind of boundaries for ourselves uh, in the work we're doing? Like when society is always trying to be activated as a kind of convincing of like a sort of consumerist mindset of facing like more shallow pleasures. Um, but like how do we we find like those kind of real signs of burnout versus like the kind of discomfort that we need to sit in and, and work with? I love this question, Kay. Thank you so much. I, for myself, I think a lot about how um, I've been trained to seek comfort through things that are demobilizing. So like a lot mm -hmm. of like self-care stuff is like consumerism, you know, or is like very individualized, like just you go get away from it all and like, uh, you know, tie it to, you know, the fantasy, the ultimate self-care fantasy in the United States is like a vacation in somewhere like Hawaii, like participate in like the gross, grotesque tourist industry and settler colonials, you know, that kind of thing. So how do I turn towards what would actually, and or go to Vegas and like be zoned out and numb at a, at a machine that's like literally taking your money for like a very unsatisfying thrill you know if you, i don't know if anyone's been to vegas but it's like atlantic city places like that you feel like this is what people have been told is fun and everybody's like so miserable it's like like a toxic center it's so heartbreaking it's so sad and it's also like the worst of heterosexuality which no one should have to be exposed to um so <laughs> anyway um i try to I've, I, actually gender somatics has a, has a question where they're like what's a resilience activity for you and it's like what is what when you do it afterwards do you feel more alive and connected um as opposed to feeling more numb like for me i'm like when i watch tv i feel more numb afterwards when mm -hmm. i walk go for a walk outside i feel more alive and connected and like and so th this is not to be moralizing it's totally fine to watch tv it's totally fine to do whatever we all need to do to get by but even and it's not about judging other people for this at all um even just like for people who use substances, are the substances like helping you feel like connected and creative or are they making you feel really like numb? And, you know, just like asking ourselves are tired or checked out, like just asking ourselves those questions, not out of a place of judgment, but just out of a place of like exactly what Kay's trying to think about. Like, am I um, finding out about the concept? A lot of people, a lot of people identify as burnout, burnt out these days. Like so many people, it's like a huge identification. And I feel a little worried about it when I meet almost every like college student I meet says they're burnt out. And I'm like, Ooh, it's just starting, <laughs> you know, like there's no chance we get to quit. And so the question isn't, um, is that a reason to never go to the, to the, you know, SJP meeting on my campus again? The question is, what do I need to be well under these conditions that do require resistance? And that can mean sometimes I don't go to the meeting. Absolutely fine. But I can't drop out of the movement for life because, you know, so, oh, do I need to have people treat each other better in these meetings? Do the meetings need to be more fun? Do we need to eat together? Do we need to more music and dance? Um, do I need, um, you know, to go to bed earlier? Like just whatever, like just, and I think a lot of people are struggling. I think uh, capitalism and like the internet culture has really fucked with us around time. We do all things at all hours. We look at our phones when we first in the middle of the night in the morning, we're like really like zoned out and addicted um, around stimulation. And so not, not surprising, we feel really terrible. And so how do I ha be countercultural in finding some level of balance? Like, do I like, what does that look like for me? And then probably I can't do it alone because it's, it's countercultural. So how do I, are me and all my friends going to be like, you know, we're all going to turn off our phones at, at midnight and go to bed, you know, three days a week even, or like, are we're all going to cook something collectively instead of ordering Uber Eats and like destroying the environment and, you know, being completely broke, you know, like, how are we going to eat more regularly? How are we going to sleep? How are we going to like, um, like, 
have aliveness around our sexuality instead of feeling like addicted to apps and like judgmental of each other and me like what all the things that are like we are human animals and then how do I not try to do that all by myself because then it becomes like a moralizing like and it's impossible like I can't by myself solve the extreme isolation of this society in which people don't make food collectively I mean it's so sad so I think that's the stuff and it and there's some kind of like lifelong discernment that none of us have figured out but you, you, you just eke along like okay does this feel like a resilience activity what's motivating me here is am i am i trying to look cool or am i actually gonna feel better you like just you know it's like a constant dilemma yeah this has been this has been a really great conversation i want to invite folks that are here to um consider going to the final session of this um on violence experimental study sequence which will be um on friday december 8th um, it'll be at a different time. It'll be at 5, 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. PST with William C. Anderson. Um, we'll be reading William's book. Um, and I know, you know, Dean, I, uh, Dean and I, and, and, and actually a previous leader of our discussion, Harsha uh, Walia, we, we, we've all been in conversation with William for, for a, a period of time now. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but Dean, I want to say I love you. I thank you. We're all grateful to you. Thank you for, for offering the gift of this book. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to assigning it over and over again. And um, and I know we appreciate the gems that you shared today, including and especially the thoughtfulness and, and, and the willingness to stay within some of the shared misery, right? The shared fear, um, the grind that we're, we kind of endure and suffer all the time. I think that there's something beautiful about the um, gesture of, of staying within that together. So um, I'm not trying to end on anything happy. I'm not, I don't believe in that. Like, I think that there's something, there's that, it's not, even though it's, even though it is shared misery, there's something beautiful about staying in there with each other. So um, contrary to the liberal tendency to want to end on a note of, of some kind of false optimism, um, I want to stay with that and say that this is exactly why I think it's important to pay attention to the lessons that you teach us about proliferation, about fostering and cultivating autonomy, uh, about, you know, enjoying all of the different things that mutual aid can do, especially because it activates us within and against our collective suffering and misery and and, and all of the asymmetries of that suffering and misery that we inhabit. So um, just thank you, Dean. Thanks Please. for having me. I want to just also refer you all on, on my website, which is deanspade.net. There's tons and tons and tons of videos that go deeper into what's in this book about like the problems. So if you're doing mutual aid work or any other organizing, there might be stuff in those videos about just like how you deal with all the nonsense that we all have to deal with. It's so hard to do this work. So I hope, and feel free to reach out to me if you ever want support with things that are in those videos or in the book. I, I wish you all luck in making it all happen. Dean will write you back. Dean will write you back and go to Big Door Brigade, Dean's website um, that I've gone to many times as well. If you if folks that are if folks here watching this video later um, don't want to get connected to things, go to Big Door Brigade. I, there, there are no other resources that I would count on more. So, um, hey, Dean, love you. Um, be good to yourself. I know you're I know you're having fun out here in L.A. So. Um, so, yeah, do your thing. Thank you for giving us some time today. Appreciate it. See you soon.